Olivia and I'm on this man's show tonight and we had a lot of fun. We did. And he gave me enough rope and I guess you'll have to watch to find out. <laughs> find out the dark, bad, evil side of Olivia Newton-John tonight. Things that frankly left me so shocked I could barely speak. <laughs> and she chokes as well, live on television. <laughs> See you at 9.30. <laughs> Thank you very kind, thank you. Good evening, welcome to Enough Rope. For almost 40 years, my first guest has seemed to effortlessly glide along as one of our show business icons. One of the rare Australian musical acts to conquer both Britain and America, her girl next door image belies the toughness necessary to stay successful over more than three decades. Please welcome a woman who's been physical, who's been greased, who honestly loves us, Olivia Newton-John. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> That's a letdown. I thought they came to see me, but <laughs> what a tremendous welcome for you. Yes, it was. Thank you so much. We don't pay them anything for that. <laughs> now, you I've been doing a, a bit of digging into your past, oh. and uh, <laughs> your grandfather, Max Born, was not only a Nobel Prize winning physicist, but Albert Einstein's best friend. Is this right? It's absolutely true. I know. It's amazing. What happened, huh? Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> my mother tells me, um, told me that uh, there used to be music in the house, and Einstein used to come and play music with my grandfather and some other scientists that used to come. Is that right? And they play string quartet music, yeah. Because you, your dad, too, he was the head of King's College at Cambridge and the vice chancellor of Melbourne Uni. That's a very deep gene pool. Are you secretly a brainiac on the dance floor. <laughs> That's about the only place, unfortunately. I don't know what happened to me, but... Uh, oh, lucky, come on. You can't play the dumb blonde. Lucky I could sing, because I believe there's a correlation between math and music, so I guess I got the music gene. Yeah. And uh, I think my father and mother always hoped that I would go to university and get a degree in something. But luckily, um, I just got it in life, <laughs> and it was fine. Were they always a bit puzzled by uh, the, the pop music career? It didn't quite fit their view of the world? I think in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. I think my father would have loved me to have done opera and studied something and they wanted me to study something and I was hopeless. I was really hopeless at school. I always felt like all the other students in the class knew what was going on and I didn't. <laughs> so, um, which is probably quite true. So luckily I could sing and uh, I think once I, they saw I was making money at it and I had a career and I had an opportunity of doing well and I was working hard because the work ethic was incredibly important. Um, it was okay. You say all the other students in class. I know one of the students in your class was Daryl Braithwaite. Yeah, that's right. Now, was he the was he the class spunk or was he a big nerd? <laughs> well, we were eleven. Yeah. So I had a crush on him actually. Which Did is, you? Yes, I used to pass notes to him because he was really cute. Is he was that in right? the choir. Did it? Could you see the Daryl that was to come? Was he kind of <laughs> in the school choir? Was he kind of shaking and moving? And doing... <laughs> well, he was really shy. That I remember. Is that right? Yeah, shy yeah. but cute. And you were, of course, into performing. You were on stage pretty regularly from from when you were about twelve, and, and on TV from when you were about fifteen. Yeah. And when you were sixteen, you appeared in this film, which we have a clip of. <laughs> Funny things happen down under. <laughs> Loosely based on the Shakespearean tragedy Macbeth, uh, I, uh, what was that about? Funny things happen down under because I'd ordered it once off the net as a porno film. I hadn't realised. <laughs> it was about a group of kids who were trying to save the the barn on one of their father's properties because mm. that's where they used to do their singing. Right. I guess. Yes. So they came up with some idea that they were going to create coloured wool, so they dyed their sheep. It was very, very creative. And they were going to raise money with these dyed sheep, yes. something like that. Yeah. It was loosely based on that. <laughs> don't make them it's like classic. that anymore, I do they? I they don't. And of course, there was, th there was some tension on the set, wasn't there? Because the love of your life, Ian Turpey, was also... Yeah, he was in the movie. Yeah. Was there, yeah. as they say, sizzle? 
between. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't the love interest. Actually, there was another girl who was the love interest. He was playing the bad boy and driving around in a fast sports car, yeah. and I was just. But he was your girl. real life love interest, yeah, he was wasn't my he? Real life. Yeah, yeah. He was. So was that? Well, so was there sexual tension on the set? Um, not between me and him. I don't think. I <laughs> No. When you were 16, you left school to yes. basically pursue a show business career. What was yes. the plan? Um, well, I was very lucky because I went, I, I went on uh, Johnny O'Keefe's Sing 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 and I won that talent contest. And with Anyone I Had a Heart, which is a very favourite song of mine. And, at the end, and I did Sunny Side Up in Melbourne a couple of times. I was asked on after that. And then at the end of the year, um, the Tarak show, which was going on, was a kid's show. And they asked me would I come on and replace lovely Anne, who was getting married, and I became lovely Livy for like uh -huh. two, two months. And then they offered me a full-time job at the station after that. So I had to decide, would I go back and finish school, or would I stay on and do the show? So, of course, what did I choose? Of yeah. course. Yeah. Um, so I stayed on and uh, did Time for Terry on a regular basis, which was an afternoon day show with Terry O'Neill, and it was a panel show, and Ian was in that show, so that was an added incentive. And that's where I got my grounding in TV because every day we, we did one show live and take one show Monday and Tuesday and did one live on Wednesday. So you had to learn a lot of songs quickly. You had to learn how to, we gave away prizes, prizes to housewives and did panel games and charades and all this stuff. So it was like a crash course. Yeah. It was really fantastic. Television University. Yes. Interestingly, your mum Irene became your manager, didn't she, she at did. this time? Now, yeah. we've seen a lot of mums managing teenage stars and it doesn't work out, it ends as a train smash. Yeah. You've got to be pretty strong, have a strong relationship for that to work, don't you? How strong were well, you with Irene? Mum was very, she was very bright and, and very strong and she, she tells me that she turned down things for me. I think she had, there was, I was offered a movie in New Zealand once but she wouldn't let me go and do that because they, they didn't, wouldn't let her go. So she was very strong and um, was very careful, but I think it got a bit much for her at some point. So, did she know? After a few how, years, how did she know what she was doing? Because show business is a, it's a whole other world. You've got sheep with their wool dyed and barns. And, I know. I mean, <laughs> that was one of her better choices. But, <laughs> uh, no, Mum, she did a great job. But I, um, I think it was just we we didn't really know. Yeah. We just kind of went with it. We went to London and. Uh, I took a year after I won the talent show on Sing 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 and we got a flat there and I signed a contract with two young guys and made a record and the review was, sounds like it was recorded in a bathroom, which it probably was. <laughs> in 69, uh, it appeared as though the big break had come when you were cast in a movie called Tomorrow, which yes. was uh, made by the guy that had packaged the monkeys, a guy called Don Kirshner. Now, we've managed to find a clip of it and here it is. <laughs> Civilization is old but is directed by minds that are young. Your civilization is young, but is controlled by minds that are old. Which is why we have never revealed our existence to your species. So why make us the exception? Because you generate certain vibrations in your music, and we need to study them. It's great. You know... Yeah. Until I saw that film, I'd never believed in such a thing as turtlenecks, but now I <laughs> see they were true. What was that about? Was that going to be the, the next big thing? This was another scintillating storyline. Yeah. Um, we, we were a group of young students that our sound, our sound was going to save the civilization in space. So mm -hmm. they came to kidnap us so that we could save the civilization. Yes. Great storyline. Yeah. Uh, great acting. Mm. The music, however, was, wasn't bad. Yeah. And, um, so it was a big pizzazz because it wasn't only Don Kirshner for the monkeys, it was Harry Saltzman who put all the Bond movies together. So oh. it was going to be like this series of, you know, Bond monkey movies, which is a strange concept. <laughs> but um, hey. it obviously didn't work. So yeah. when do you, I often wonder with these things, when did you realise that this big thing is nothing? Is there a moment? Uh, probably when you're sitting in the premiere <laughs> <laughs> and you're looking around and there's like nothing. <laughs> Um, you know, you kind of have a feeling. Alan Carr, who produced Grease, yes. said of you, you know, don't be fooled by the, the sort of virginal image that not <laughs> only... Bit late. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bit late. This must have been a long time. Yes, it was. <laughs> well, listen, this is around the time... But he said, look, you're very smart mind and nothing in your career has ever happened by accident. Yeah. Are you tougher than you've chosen to let on? Well, I'm strong. I don't, the word tough, I don't like. Well, but strong I guess I've toughed it out, yeah. that's for sure. But, you know, all those beginning things that I've gone through, you know, they're all part of the growing process. It looks like it's an overnight thing, but really it's taken a long time. And I'm, I think um, 
I've been very, I've been very fortunate. You know, I had great musical songs, were written by great people, I had great managers. Um, and I look at all those things that you could look back and go, they were negative as your building blocks of what you learn and how you learn. The thing was, this was a time when you came to prominence in America, when Helen Reddy also mm -hmm. uh, came to prominence with Iron Women, Woman, Women, I don't think there were two of them. <laughs> and uh, feminism was very much on the rise. Was, was that a thing for you? Were you a part of all of that? Not, not knowingly. Not knowingly? No, I think, I think that I, I, I've always believed that, I did believe then that women kind of were stronger than they led on to believe. I think women are very strong and often get things done without making a big stance about it. So I didn't really get involved in all that. No, I didn't. You I didn't, didn't say much politically about anything. You didn't ever point. just singe your bra? <laughs> 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 Interestingly though, you were, and long before it was fashionable, you were quite outspoken about the environment. In the 70s, mm. at one point, you refused to go to Japan until they changed their fishing practices because they were killing dolphin. Yes. something which is still happening today, I think. And more recently, you've spoken out against uh, logging in Tasmania and the use of poisons, the 1080 poisons. Now, for somebody that didn't normally go to the barricades, what led you to speak out about those things? Well, actually, I have to credit Helen Reddy for the dolphin thing also because she had told me what was going on and she was not going to go to Japan. And Helen and, and her husband at the time, Jeff Ward, were a, um, very influential in, at that time in my life. They kind of convinced me to move to America. She said, if you want to be successful here, you should move here. And they were very helpful to me. I met Alan Carr at their house. And um, the logging thing, I've always loved trees and been very aware of the, of the environment. I think my mother made me aware of that also. She was always aware of waste and was always writing letters to the council about things. And um, But it's very involved. easy for when a celebrity speaks about, out about the environment to end up being parodied. You know, what do you know? Yeah. What do you care? You're just there for the photo opportunity. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what led you to make that step, however? Because this isn't normally you to speak out about this. Well, in the 70s, things. that was a big step because yeah. I was kind of normally very quiet about it. But I saw the pictures of the dolphin slaughter and I was so upset. I was mortified. And that's why I made that stand. I love dolphins. I had an amazing affinity with dolphins for some reason. And... Um, so I did say something and there was a big backlash. I really? Mean, the Japanese were pretty angry for a long time and I didn't go back for a long time. But that's okay. I think they made some changes, which was the important thing. You, the other part of your image was always as uh, the girl next door. And in fact, uh, your, Bronner, your sister once described you as like a latter day uh, Doris Day. You know, uh, what was it? She said, nice but pretty and naive. Did she get you right or were you also at times a baddie two shoes? Uh, I'm not telling. Um, <laughs> I think that, that that was pretty much... I think you just did tell, not, by the way, and so yeah. I'm not telling. <laughs> there you go. I actually, uh, I love Doris Day. I've always loved her. I thought she was amazing. On my new album, I sing one of her songs in kind of... What's the word? Tribute. Tribute, yes. Yeah. Was it good to be thought of, to have this image, though, as a, a goody two-shoes? Did it mean you could get away with things that people would never suspect you of? I don't know snorting cocaine off Cliff Richard's buttocks, <laughs> things like that. You read that? You heard that? No. Well, Cliff was on last week and he told us about it, so I was... Um, I, I don't think I thought too much. I think I was lucky to have any kind of image, you know, and I was just... I was, I was happy to be successful and I think as my career went on and I did Greece, I had an opportunity to show different sides of my personality or whatever, but, you know, I think that I leaned on more to the side of goody tissues is kind of a probably going too far, but I guess that's... A goody you... one shoe, perhaps. Uh, yeah, there you go, there you go. Because <laughs> in Greece, which was yeah. a, a seminal moment uh, for you, when you, towards the end of the movie, when you came out as Sandy, the sort of sexy biker chick, mm. was that liberating or were you a little bit worried about how that would be taken? No, I wasn't worried about that because it was in character. So it was really, oh, it was so much fun. You know, yeah. the, the first day that I got to we went to try on clothes, went to wardrobe and I was trying on the different outfits that we could try and they did my hair and makeup. And John was recording the song Sandy. It was a nighttime drive-in scene and I was still there because I was working with makeup and hair. And I walked onto the set in my outfit and walked around the back of the crew. So I always remember it because it's one of those moments that you remember. And they all turned around and no one knew it was me. And I had this reaction, I thought, God, what have I been doing these last two months? This is how I should have been. It was really fun. It was really such a fun to play that, that
that cheeky girl. It was really great. I loved it. There seemed to be a real, a genuine electricity between you and John Travolta. Mm -hmm. Was that so? I think there was electricity, yeah. Absolutely. Ian Turpy like electricity. <laughs> <laughs> No, we were just friends. Just good friends. <laughs> no, I think we had chemistry and I think that worked. And yeah. I think the fact that we weren't anything, we weren't boyfriend and girlfriend, kept the electricity going because mm. that's what made it, you know, exciting. But that's right, it's the forbidden fruit. Yeah, exactly. The most he's, he's a lovely, lovely man. He's still as delightful as he always was. I think I've got this right. Your dad, Bryn, he died in 92 yes. uh, of liver cancer on the same day you were diagnosed with breast cancer, is yes, that right? Yes, it's true. That would have to be as tough a day as you can have. It was a really, uh, it was one of those weekends. It was July 4th weekend in, in, in America and I was on holiday and I had a needle biopsy a week before but had flown out to see Dad and he was very ill and I hadn't told him that I'd had this biopsy to find out if I indeed did have anything wrong. And then I got back to America telling him I was going to come back because I was supposed to start touring the next week and I got a call that um, he had died and it was an incredible shock because I thought I was going to go back and see him so it was very sudden. And my husband at the time had had a call from the doctor in Los Angeles that he wanted to see me but he didn't tell me that over the weekend because he thought one thing was enough yeah. to cope with. So I, only found, I found that out on the Monday but it was one of the, I didn't have a real chance to grieve my father because I had to cope with my own survival. So it was a, a very, a very, very difficult time. Have you ever found a way or a place to grieve for him? I have. I mean, it's been a, it was, it's been a process, a process of time. But um, at that immediate time, it was like, you know, it was all going on. I couldn't come back for the funeral because I had to start, I had to get surgery and chemotherapy and see doctors. And so I had to, how you put grief on a back burner, I had to be positive about, so it was a mix, I was getting all these mixed messages but I knew that I had to stay strong in order to survive what I was going through. He would have expected nothing less, he I'm sure. He would have, exactly. Yes. You didn't tell, at the time when you had the breast cancer, you didn't tell Chloe, your daughter. Why no. was that? Because um, a few years before that she'd lost her best friend to cancer, Colette Tudor. And Colette and she had grown up together. They were born six weeks apart and her mother Nancy was one of my dearest friends and we'd planned our pregnancies, we'd got pregnant at the same time, we'd had our babies together and it was, it was kind of idealistic, perfect. We'd travel everywhere together, the girls would play together. And she died and she had cancer and Chloe knew that. So I thought if I told her mummy has cancer then it would mean to her that I was going to die. Mm. So we made that decision. Sometimes I think maybe it was the wrong one because children read what's going on even if you don't tell them they know something's innately wrong. But at the time, it was the right thing to do. And then when I came back to Australia a year later, when I was in recovery, she went to school the first day and some child said, ah, oh, I've read in the paper, your mum had cancer. That was the first she knew of it and oh, wow. came running home from school and said, and told me that what had been said and she was furious because she was by then seven, I think. And I had to explain why I had made that decision. And but it's hard to explain to a little girl why you did that. So she said, but I could have taken care of you. She was so sweet. Yeah. But, um, it, you know, I did what I think was right at the time. And at that time also you had a friend who was uh, a Buddhist who said something very interesting to you. When you got the cancer, he said, congratulations, now you will grow. Yes. Was he right? That was Nancy's husband, Jim. Is that right? And um, I, 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 I was a little puzzled when he said it. I now totally understand what he means. I, it was a, one of those moments you never forget. And I, I thought, he's a very wise man and he must have a reason to say this and I know I will see this eventually, and I did. And they were very, um, very strong in that time period because they'd lost their daughter. Um, Nancy would lost her brother to AIDS. So it was like they had been through so much and yet they had such strength and solidarity as a couple and belief. Even though Nancy was Jewish, she was a Buddhist, she was a Jubu, as we call her. And they would chant together, and I would chant with them, even though I'm not a, a Buddhist, I would find great peace in that. Whatever spiritual release I could find, I would do it. And um, I learned a lot from that, and I think he's totally right. I think whatever you go through, even if it seems incredibly difficult at the time, when you look back, you realise it was an experience you would not have give, you would not give up if you survive it, which I was lucky enough to do. Indeed. When you grow, you shed things, of course. Yes. What did you shed as a result of that experience? I think I shed an innate fear of, of dying, 
which when I read some of my old interviews, I would talk about that or I would talk about getting old and dying. Now I'm, great, I'm grateful to get old. I, th I feel it's a blessing if I manage to get there. And dying, um, I think everyone worries about that. How will it happen? What will it be like and all that? But it's not something that plays on my mind anymore because I feel that I've, I've had a second opportunity. Last year, your mum Irene died and you held a big memorial service for her at the Melbourne Botanical Gardens. Tell me about the woman you celebrated. My mum was a, an amazing person. She was very strong, um, vibrant, interested in life, um, got involved in community. Even months before she was dying, she was ringing the council because they were cutting down trees in the street and she was very upset about it. And, and she was an amazing, amazing photographer. And so at her memorial, um, I'd always planned to do this while she was alive. And I, I, my one regret is that I didn't make that particular effort while she was here because she would have loved it. But we did it in her memory. And I chose about, well, the family and I chose about 30 photographs, some of her favorite ones, and had them framed and put them in a beautiful house that's in the gardens, invited all the friends and family. And people came from all over the world. She had distant relatives in Mexico, friends from America, um, friends from all over Australia. And it was an amazing celebration of her life. And I made a video and had that put together of her whole life from her birth until the very end. And even in her last day, she was incredibly graceful and did everything with great dignity. Did you get to farewell her as you wanted to? I did. I was there. Mm. Um, I was on the road. I was working. And my sister came out because mum wasn't doing well and they called me and said, I think you better come home. And I was in Las Vegas and told everybody, I have to leave. So I must admit, everyone was incredible. The promoters, everybody was amazing. That There was no drama. They all just rescheduled next year. And I, I left that night, got on a plane the next morning and, and came out and I managed to she rallied for about three days. So I was with her for her, her last moment, which is a, a mind life altering thing, mm. to be with someone for their last breath. And I feel very lucky. It is extraordinary to see a, a human being and one who has been so much part of your life emptied out, isn't it? Yes, it's, uh, you realise that really the, the person is the spirit because once the spirit is gone, that is not the person you knew anymore. And, you, and I felt her spirit very strongly. We had some quite amazing experiences with her spirit afterwards. So um, if I had any doubts before, I don't now. <laughs> what sort of things? Um, this is an amazing story. I, I kept family don't mind me sharing it, but I had brought a candle from um, America and put it in the lounge room and the last few days it was burning and people were coming by to see her and I had a photograph there and flowers and um, I had always said to her please give me a sign when you when you go that you're okay because when my mother had always told me that when her mother died a photograph of her fell off the wall and she always felt this was a sign from her mother so I had said to her well when you go, please give me a sign. And my mother was not particularly religious. In fact, I'd say she was probably agnostic, but she, she said she would, she would try with a slight smile on her face, not quite sure if she really believed it, but I always hoped she would. So I went, to, went in to sit with her um, about an hour after she had gone and I asked her, because I felt an incredible presence in the room. It was an energy that I've never felt before. And so I said to her mum, please let me know you're okay. I want to know that everything's all right. And um, I said, I looked around the room, I thought, what can I ask her to do, you know? And there was no, nothing in there except we had some candles going under the window. I said, can you make the candles move, make the candles flicker, something? And um, the candles moved a little bit and, you know, that was enough for me. I went, oh, great, that's, she's okay. And then there was a shout from the living room, my sister and my, my niece and my friends and family were in the other room and they screamed, Olivia, Olivia, come out here. And I'm going, can't they just leave me alone to have quiet time with mum? I'm going, for goodness sake, at this moment. So I got up and I opened the door and I said, what, what? And they said, you'll never believe what happened. They said, a, a second ago, the candle in here exploded. And the whole candle went right under her picture. So we all just, I, and I told them what had just happened and we all 
kind of hugged and laughed and cried and, and felt that everything was okay. So that was my... My sign was a pretty powerful one. She was a pretty powerful lady. Yeah, that's an extraordinary story. Yeah, if that amazing. had been the plot of Tomorrow, it would have been a much stronger <laughs> film. <laughs> You're right. The album you brought out, Indigo, it's, it's actually uh, dedicated to... Whoa, this... <laughs> No, sorry. Let's switch. Moving okay. around. No, it's actually to do with mothering because uh, yes. your daughter Chloe wants to go into show business. This yes. album you've just brought out is, I think, it's your thirty-second album. Is it really? Your second album. Thirty <laughs> second. <laughs> it's a very different industry to the one you entered as a sixteen-year-old. Chloe mm. wants to be a singer. Mm. Is there any advice you can give her? I ha I have given her advice. I think my advice is to just be who she is because. She has a very strong sense of her own style, what she wants to sing, how she wants to do it, kind of similar to how I was, excuse me, with my mother. Excuse me, Mum, it cheers. That's all right. Cheers. I'll, I'll do some thinking music. Mm. Maybe mm. I hang around you. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> we both oh, know that... I've got some place else to go. Choke there for a moment. Uh, so I tell her. Yeah, that would have been I, great for the promo. <laughs> Tonight, Olivia Newton John chokes live on television. Oh. Could you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of puns. There's a lot of puns I could make, but I, I'll stick to where we are. Um, so I think my main advice has been to to be who she is, and I think being my daughter, she has a very strong idea of what, how she wants to be and she wants to write her own music. She has a very different voice than me, which is great. She looks very different than me, although when I look at the old stuff, yeah. when I was, you know, 17 or something, I, I see a similarity, which is nice. <laughs> but um, she's, she's a wonderful young person, very, a very spiritual and sweet human. Despite the travails, you've had in many ways a blessed life, I think it's fair I to have, say. Yeah. What haven't you done yet? Choked on television, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we can wait all night. What haven't I done? Oh, goodness. I'm sure there's a thousand million things. I think the thing you discover as you get older. I think when you're young, you think you know everything, you've done everything. Mm. As you get older, you realise how much more there is. I'd like to, I'd like to row on the, on the Yarra. I'd like to learn carpentry. I'd like to learn how to make a square, you know, like to hammer a nail and learn basics. I'd like to... I mean, there's so many things I'd like to paint. I, I am working towards spending more time in Australia and spending more time doing those things. That's, you know, in my retirement. <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm I've a lucky person. Really, really come to resent you over the course of this interview. <laughs> <laughs> Being yourself works for you wonderfully. Olivia Newton John, thank, thank you very you much. Thank you so much.